Dear BPC, welcome to worship and welcome to all of our visitors today. Our call to worship comes from the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, from verse 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. As we enter the exciting time of Advent, I pray that all of our lights will shine brightly and we have a wonderful time together at worship today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your word says that we are born into sin, but your word also says that your grace is sufficient for us to be lifted out of sin and be forgiven. We acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved as you have taught us. We find it difficult to forgive even the slightest transgression against us. We confess that we long too much for what the world has to offer and too little of what you have to offer. 
Forgive us for the harsh judgments we have made of others and the pain we have caused. Forgive us for the times we were too proud to admit we were wrong. Forgive us for the failures in the face of temptations. Forgive us for disregarding the needs of others, especially the poor and needy. We acknowledge that we are spiritually poor, but through Jesus Christ we ask that you strengthen our faith and our trust in you. We just want to thank you, Lord, for loving us, for encouraging us, and for your continued presence in our lives. Lord, have mercy on us and make us whole for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grant us the grace to please you, Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Credo for humans. We believe that Jesus is fully God and fully human, God in the flesh, that the Word became a human being and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. We believe in the human Christ and trust in the humanity of Christ. We believe that Jesus is the icon of the Father and in his human life associated himself with us fully. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Jesus revealed the way to human life. 
Jesus unveiled for us the truth of human life. Jesus is our life. We believe in the incarnation, that God embraced humanity and continues to embrace all people with his life and death and resurrection, calling upon his church to do the same. We believe that Jesus loves all human beings, calling upon his church to do the same. We believe that Jesus is the head of his body, the church, and that Jesus reigns in our humanness by the Holy Spirit of God. We believe that the Holy Spirit of God lives within us, empowering us to be as Jesus to all people. We believe in Jesus Christ, Lord of the cosmos and of humans world without end. Our reading is from Isaiah 64, 1-9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf and our, our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not exceedingly, do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider we are all your people. Praise be to God. A short while ago, a movie was released called Don't Look Up. And it's a kind of a black comedy satire, and it's about politics and it's apocalyptic. So it's about the end of the world. And of course, the movie is, is directed at global warming, but it's really about not looking up because looking up is going to, you're going to see a comet that's going to come down and destroy all of humanity. One of the quotes that I like, love from the movie is this one, where you get one of the characters, Kate Dibiaski, who's talking to Dr. Randall Mindy, and she says, we have exactly six months, 10 days, two hours, 11 minutes, and 41 seconds until a comet the size of Chiluba tears through the atmosphere and extincts all life on Earth. And Dr. Randall Mindy replies, when do you do these calculations? And Kate Dubiaski says, I put the moment of impact on a diet app. Now, I don't want to talk about global warming today, but I do want to talk about uh, our world. Our world is in a dire place for more than one reason. I joked with someone this week about our own country and the troubles in our own country and said that if we started complaining right now and we continued to complain um, about what was going on in our country, we would never have enough time while we're alive 
to complete the complaints, never mind the solutions. But what is happening in our world? I read an article called What Terrible Things, What Terrible Things Are Happening in the World Right Now That a Lot of People Don't Know. And in the article, he doesn't really uh, give us the ones we don't know, but he, and I'm not going to go through all of that, but he, I want to read to you the headings, his own headings. Um, he starts by saying, unfortunately, we live in a world that is filled with danger, corruption, sadness, and crime. And his headings are like this, sad and scary, unfair, awful, can't catch a break, terrible, wow, didn't know about this, a harsh reality, sad but true, a tough situation, grim, concerning. Aren't there some of the things that we feel and think when it comes to what's going on in our world, what's going on in our own country and in our own society? At the moment, there are many, many world wars going on, or world wars, wars in the world going on. There's the war in Afghanistan, where you have the Taliban fighting against the Afghan government. It started in 2001, then you had the US coming in, and that war has resulted in the deaths of over 240,000 people and has displaced millions more. Then there's the war in Yemen, with, by the way, that war is still going on. The war in Yemen, that war began in 2015 when the Houthi rebels aligned with Iran and seized control of the capital. And that war has resulted in the deaths of 150,000 people and it's created a severe humanitarian crisis. What about the war in Syria? That began in 2011 as the pro protests against the government of Bashar al-Assad turned into a fully blown uh, armed conflict. That war has resulted in the deaths of over 500,000 people and has displaced many, many more. Um, Ethiopia, the Tigray war, which began in 2020 when the Liberation Front attacked the Ethiopian military bases in the Tigray region, and that war has resulted in the deaths of over 100,000 people and millions have been displaced because of it. Then there's the war in Myanmar that began in 2021 when the Cation uh, Independence Organization and other armed ethnic groups launched an, a coordinated attack on government forces. That war resulted in the deaths of 5,000 people. Hundreds of thousands have been displaced because of it. Then there's the war in South Sudan, which began in 2013, when the then president, Salva Kiir, accused his former vice president, Rick Mahar, of plotting a coup. That war resulted in the deaths of over 400,000 people and millions have been displaced, displaced because of it. We know and remember the war in Ukraine. The Russian, Russia-Ukrainian war began in 2014 when Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine. And in 2022, Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, which has already resulted in the deaths of over 10,000 people and millions have been displaced. Then there's the war in Mexico, the drug war, which began in 2006, maybe before that, when uh, the president, Felipe Calderon, deployed the military to kind of combat the drug cartels. That war resulted in over 300,000 people dying. Millions have been displaced. Then there's the Colombia. The Colombian armed conflict began in the 1960s between the Colombian government and the various left-wing guerrilla groups. And that war has resulted in over 220,000 people dying. Then we have the war in Israel and Gaza, which we know about. It's very topical. But the truth is that this is a darkness. This is a, there are horrible things going on in our world, in our, in our country, even in our own communities. And uh, into these realities, 
we we are plunged, we, we live, and yet we have no control over them. People do think they have some impact when they protest loudly in the streets or in the places where protest is allowed. But we, we honestly very often don't have any control over what is going on. Now, the book of Isaiah, where our text comes from, is one of the major prophetic books in the Old Testament. Uh, it is traditionally attributed to Isaiah, who lived in the 8th century uh, BC. And the book is divided, as I've said to you before, when I preached on it, into two sections. Proto-Isaiah, first Isaiah, chapters 1 to 39, which is largely about messages of, of uh, to the people of Judah, which is the southern part of, of, of the Jewish people, uh, their kingdom. And um, they're told that they're moving away from God. The social justices, injustices are, are spoken about. Then in, in, in Proto-Isaiah, uh, Isaiah emphasizes the importance of repentance, turning back to God. And there are also prophecies about the two invasions uh, of the Assyrians in the north and then the Babylonians in the south that led to the exile of the Jewish people. The second Isaiah, uh, or Deutero-Isaiah, uh, is, is made up of, of um, messages of comfort and hope and redemption. It's written largely during the time of exile, when the Babylonians had come and invaded the, the, the land of Judah, and they'd taken all the, the, the people who were artisans, people who had things to offer them, and they took those people and they took them to their own country, uh, Babylon, their own land, and they were away from their own country, and they were away from everything they knew, they were away from the temple, and into that situation Isaiah speaks words of comfort, and the tone of judgment in the first part of Isaiah uh, shifts to the promise of God restoring these people. Now we come to our passage specifically. Our passage reads like a psalm because it is a prayer that calls to God for help, for perspective, for change. And sometimes the only thing that we can do is pray. When we cannot see the light, when we are in the darkness, then all that we can do is pray. And, and the psalmists often uh, give us an understanding of that. But the first thing that Isaiah prays for is that God would come. Isaiah 64 verse 1. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when the fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil. To make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, from ages past no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait, him, who wait for him. Now, of course, we are entering Advent, uh, the time when we move towards the um, beauty of the coming of Jesus being born in the flesh. And Advent is a time of waiting. It's waiting for what we long for. And sometimes it's waiting in the deep darkness. And in that deep darkness, the writer says, God works for those who wait for him. And he expresses a plea and a prayer for God's intervention and mercy. He says, tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake. Now this image of tearing open the heavens is found only here in the Bible. And the verb has an idea of tearing garments. Um, you know, in, in those days when people grieved, they would often tear and rip their clothing in gestures of mourning or grief. But here, the ripping open is applied to the heavens. God, tear open the heavens, come down. We need you to come and engage with us, intervene. Let's look a little bit more at the context. 
the, the chapter reflects a yearning for a renewed relationship with God, an appeal for God's intervention in the face of people's shortcomings. The glory of Israel had long faded. The people had been invaded, they'd been carried into captivity, and they'd been exiles in a foreign land. And we have a lot of exiles in our country. Uh, most of them have come here because they've sought a better place. But in this case, in Babylon, uh, the people of Israel were there because of the invasion. They'd been taken away from their homeland. And um, this Babylonian exile in the 6th century, uh, when the southern kingdom of Judah was conquered, uh, is a very important theme in, in the whole of the New Testament, actually. Um, and let's look at what was in the heart of the people. The people of God were defeated, literally and psychologically. They felt defeated. They had drifted away from their core faith because they didn't have the landmarks of their faith there, which was the land, which was the, the, um, the temple, which was one another. They therefore had neglected religious observance. In other words, they stopped praying, they stopped worshipping, they stopped doing the things that they were doing when they were in their, their homeland. And the book of Isaiah says they also lived in open rebellion against God. Uh, their rulers had set up false idols and were corrupt um, and disregard for the poor and the ill-disposed was rampant and the people refused to listen to the prophets to messages from God when the prophets came and told them that God wanted them back to restore them they they didn't want to know so it was a long time since they'd experienced prosperity and before they'd experienced God and God had seemed for many years uh, far away they felt, they felt as if God had abandoned them. Uh, he says in verse, uh, the second part of, of verse 7, You've hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. This is what they feel. This is not what God has done. God hasn't hidden himself. But it, they feel as if God is no longer looking at them in favor. They feel that they've been handed over to their own sin. And uh, what a terrible thing it would be for us to be handed over uh, to our own sin, to our own iniquity, as he says. So they felt God had let them go. And now in captivity, God sent people in there to, in there to talk to them, to help them recall their past. Sometimes we need to remember the past so that we can move back to a new place. And the, 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 the writer, I almost said psalmist, but the writer of the psalm in Isaiah says, we remember how you intervened in the past on our behalf. We long to experience your presence, God. And so he opens up with, with the anguished words, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. Come down, God. Come down. Come Come see us, God. Come to us in power. Come to us in a visible sign. Now, there are people that in our lives that we don't want to come and visit us. Maybe it's our aunt and uncle that uh, we battle with, or maybe it's cousin, or maybe it's that friend who keeps on coming and then doesn't leave for days. Um, I remember that when I was a boy, that my parents had had two kind of ways of getting uh, us, making us aware of what was happening. The one was if we saw a car pull up, my father was quite an uh, introverted man and he didn't want to always see people. So if, if it was somebody that my mom and dad didn't want to see, we would have to hide. So it would be like, oh, Auntie Billy's here, hide. And then we'd all 
duck, duck down, we'd hide behind the bed, we'd just sit down, we'd have to be quiet. And I remember, it didn't happen very often, but I just remember a knock at the door and we would just be quiet. And sometimes we would, as children, would say, but mommy, there's somebody at the door. My brother would say, shh, shh, down, shh. So there are people that you don't want to come and visit. We, we'd hope that they'd knock and then eventually that they'd, they'd disappear. Uh, some of them were quite persistent and they'd look through the, the, the front door and through the windows to see if we were there. But then there are people that we want to come and visit us. You long for them to come and visit. Um, and amongst those were my granddad and my nan, my grandmother. They would often visit us and especially on a Saturday midday. Now I had wonderful grandparents whom I was very close to on my mother's side. And they were loving and they were true. My grandmother was so gentle and humble and loving. My grandfather was strong and powerful and kind. And on a Saturday, I remember many Saturdays where we would hear a knock at the door and we'd come out and there on the stairs of our house, uh, especially the days when we didn't have groceries, there would be 10 to 20 bags of groceries that they had there for us. And we would go into that treasure trove and bring the groceries inside and then we'd have a wonderful lunch together. Um, they visited with power and they visited with beneficence. The Hebrews wanted and needed a visit from God. The Bible tells us that God is a visiting God, a God who moves towards us in the best possible way. Uh, the Bible begins with this creator God, not only bringing creation into being, but visiting our first parents in the Garden of Eden. In fact, according to Genesis 3, the Lord came walking in the neighborhood where Adam and Eve lived. And the Lord called to the man and said, where are you? God visited Abraham in the guise of angels who sat down for a meal. God visited Jacob, wrestling with him in the night. God visited, visited Moses in the burning bush on Mount Sinai and elsewhere. God's presence went with the Israelites through the wilderness in the form of the fire and the cloud. God visited Samuel as a boy, calling him in the sleeping hours. God visited Elijah in a still small voice. So when, but here, when the prophet cries, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, the prophet is asking that God visit in a different way, with power, with awe, um, in a, maybe in a scary way he's asking, because he speaks about power with earthquake. He's asking for power because he knows that what is needed is a powerful visitation of God, that what is needed in the world that he inhabits, the world of the exile, is the power of God to change people's lives, to change even the circumstances. And he, when he says this, he is recalling some of the other passages calling God to come. There's many of them in the Bible. I'll give you a few examples. Psalm 7, verse 6. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. So there's a calling on God to come and, and make right, bring justice. Or in Psalm 94, O Lord God of vengeance, O God of vengeance, shine forth, rise up, O judge of the earth, repay to the proud what they deserve. So somebody saying, God, come, come just finish the injustice, the corruption, the, the wars, the, the sadness, the brokenness. And if you look towards the last book of the Bible in the New Testament, you see a similar thing. It says in Revelation 6 verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So these souls who have died, they cry out, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Now these, this calling upon God to come is not 
doesn't mean that God is a judgmental, vicious God. It simply means that the one who prays has had enough and is asking for God's intervention. For God to visit in such a way that he finishes off the problem that is being faced. And what is anticipated in the prayer is an act of God to return justice. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. As fire kindles the brushwood, as fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things which we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. In Psalm 80, the, the, the psalm writer also calls out in anguish to God, not understanding the horrible contrasts between God's earlier redemptive acts and promises and what is now happening. And he implores the shepherd of Israel to show the brilliant light of his presence and deliver his flock, Israel. There's a, a repeated how long uh, in verses four to six, which is very frequent in the Psalms. Now the key uh, is to catch the full significance of the refrain in verses three, seven and 19. There's a repeat, repeat and it's repeated and repeated. Verse three says, restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. Come, restore us. And then Verse 7 begins with, Restore us, O God of hosts. And then verse 19 begins, Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Now the expansion of the name of God, because it says, O God, and then it says, O God of hosts, and then it says, O Lord God of hosts. It's not just a literary device. It conveys the escalation of the psalmist's inner groaning and heart, heartfelt plea to God who alone can restore what has been lost. So it's, oh God, and then it's, oh God of hosts, and then it's, oh Lord, God of hosts, come, tear open the heavens. There's something beautiful in the mechanism of prayer. Prayer is a strange thing. It's not making simple requests to God. Prayer is about an awareness of God. It's about acknowledging need. It's about making our need clear to ourselves. It's about finding a way to connect with God and for God to connect with us. It's asking God what we want as well and then waiting upon Him. Prayer is also waiting. The prophet feels as though they're in something of a quarantine that they must be infected or something. Maybe there's some reason God is staying away. Um, he suspects, as often the writers of these poems do, that something is wrong. He says in verse five, you meet those who gladly do right. But he also knows that God works for those who wait for him. Echoing Lamentations 3. It's been a long time since they've had a visit from their father. He complains that God has left them, committing his own people to an unwelcome quarantine. No visits from God, no meals left at the door, no face-to-face -face encounters, no Zoom, no nothing. And in this process of prayer, he acknowledges that him and the people have infected the relationship with their sin and idolatry. Even though God is not a judgmental God, which we see through Jesus, and I'll explain that in a moment, our God is a God who acknowledges the um, horribleness, the impact of sin and idolatry. There's always going to be an impact of sin, because sin is really hurting people. Sin is either hurting people or hurting God. And in that process of sin, we damage other people and we damage ourselves. And the, the writer of this psalm in Isaiah recognizes this. He says, now you hid yourself. That's what he feels. And then he reminds God in a beautiful way. He reminds God in his prayer. 
which is really a restatement to himself to continue to hope. He reminds himself about who God is and what God has done. For from days of old they haven't heard or perceived by ear, nor has the eye uh, seen a God besides you, who acts on behalf of the one who waits for him. So he tells us that God is aware of those who wait, wait with expectation, wait with prayer. God is aware of those who wait on him. God come to us. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become. She was once great among the nations. She was a princess among the provinces and she has become a slave. Those words are from Lamentations, which is one of the, the books about that exile. So let us remember that this prayer was heard by God as all prayers are. And let us also remember that God did tear open the heavens and come with power. Yes, he did, he answered. But God answered in a way, in the least obvious way. And he didn't answer immediately. God came and snuck in amongst us, being born in human form. He tore open the heavens and he became a little baby, a human baby. God visited us. Look the virgin, the Bible says, look the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Yes, the heavens were torn open. Philippians tells us, though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. Sometimes prayers that we pray only get answered years later. But God heard this prayer. He hears the prayers of those who wait on him. And he sent Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, Help us to wait expectantly to you, for you this Advent season. As we remember to wait even in the midst of the darkness of our world, we wait for Jesus who came and was an answer to our prayer, became one with us and who lives with us forever. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us pray. Merciful Father, we bring to you all in need of your loving care. The ill, the lonely, the frightened, the bereaved, the weary, and those who for whatever reason are outcasts of society. We pray that the cycle of gender-based violence and crime and murder in general would cease through the conviction of your Holy Spirit and by the establishment of good fair governance toward all people in our society. Kindle in each of us the desire and resourcefulness to ease the pain and suffering of our neighbours. Sovereign Lord, we pray for the leaders of all nations and particularly our state president and his cabinet and ask that they will seek to govern with integrity, be blessed with wisdom and seek the good of all their citizens displaying an increasing dependence on the one who holds the whole world in his hand. Father, we are saddened and conflicted by the situation in Israel and Palestine, and we pray for leaders to seek and commit to a peaceful and viable solution of the complex problems in that region. We know nothing is impossible for you. Finally, Lord Jesus, we pray that as Christ's body on earth, your church in all its diversity would be a powerful, pertinent and compassionate expression of your grace and truth that was, is and evermore shall be. This we pray in your glorious name. Amen. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.